<coughs> May I give rise to the altruistic, altruistic mind of Bodhicitta and through listening, reflecting and practicing the Dharma, may I be able to place all mother sentient beings on the state of perfect enlightenment. <coughs> So, to continuing from our previous discussion, how about the four foundations? <coughs> She <laughs> Jola, 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 Jola,
The songs of Melarava, the songs for meeting the Palarbum, the way of meeting the lineage. So, uh, this uh, shows the importance of lineage. 
importance of unbroken tradition of the instructions. Like in the Kaju lineage prayer, we have a line. Like talks of, so we can have, like it says that to the lineage masters who has actualized the profound uh, meaning of the Mahamudra, I supplicate so that I may be able to uh, continue the legacy or follow in their lineage, the continued lineage. So the so this shows the process of process the stages of uh, following in the footsteps of the great masters and their lineage. So just by receiving teachings doesn't mean that we uh, connect with the lineage. Just because we receive the instructions like Dzogchen and Mahamudra doesn't mean we are continuing the legacy. So what is the mark of being the mark of being able to? continue the lineage or follow in the or carry on the lineage is that first we need to uh, be as certain that the, 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 the instructions that we are receiving from the source the great masters themselves are realized and so from them so uh, the criteria even for us to continue with the lineage is that first we need to the, the kind of the superior way of doing it is by actualizing the meaning of the teachings that one have received. First, actualizing, being able to realize the whole the, the kind of instructions that we have received. So, even if you cannot do the superior process, we're able to do that. For even if you cannot realize the uh, the whole meaning, we, at least the middling we need to have the, that some kind of experiences some kind of experiential knowledge of having practiced the teachings. And uh, even if you cannot do that, we should at least have uh, the, the confidence and the devotion in the lineage and the master that we are following. So when we say athletes, when we say the, the inferior, when we say the, the average kind of criteria is to have the uh, unwavering faith and devotion a kind of a competence, a kind of a, a inspiration from the lineage. So we have, so according to the one's own capacity, one can one can approach the lineage or the master or the authentic masters. So even, for example, the average criteria is to have the unwavering faith, be able to develop the average faith. Even to do that, I think if us, we need to uh, receive <coughs> the authentic lin uh, teachings from the authentic lineage and be able to uh, uh, be able to listen and reflect and practice the teachings. Uh, if not just because we uh, go to a teacher and receive some teaching, I think there's not enough. We need to have some some transformation, some 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 transformation in the mind, and the transformation can come in various capacities. Uh, so the average one is to have at least have, uh, become inspired. Okay, okay, drink tea. Let's have tea. <laughs> so, so the to continue from the songs, songs from meeting the Baldrapum. The way of meeting the lineage. So it's a series of songs. So the first one is the way of meeting the lineage. First is Samantha Badra, the pervasive Dharmakaya. Second is the Great Vajradara, the Sambhokagaya of marks and signs. Third is Shakyamuni, the Nirmanakaya that benefits beings. I am a yogi who holds these three lineages. Is there a female student with faith in these three? Mm. So talking about the lineage. So when we talk about Dharmakaya. So the Dharmakaya means the actual reality, the basic reality, the abiding nature of all things. That is Dharmakaya. So the, uh, in a different uh, instructions, like for example Mahamudra, the Dharmakaya is interpreted in a different way. For example, we say uh, the wisdom of the abiding nature. The wisdom of abiding nature is called Dharmakaya. So Dharmakaya is referred to 
as the abiding nature, the wisdom of the abiding nature. <clears throat> and uh, that is believed to be pervasive, pervasive to all, pervasive to all sentient beings, that it lies at the nature, at the abiding nature of all beings. So Dharmakaya, according to the Muhammad lineage, is nature of all beings. So, uh, and, and secondly, uh, the Sambukakaya of Marx and Science is the Vajradara. So again, uh, so, so the Dharmakaya is the Samandabhadra, the Sambukakaya is the Vajradara, and the Manakaya is the Shakyamuni. So talking about the ultimate, ultimate form of the Bodhi. So all those things different. So Milarabha is just giving an example. So just giving the examples that in Milarabha's tradition, he meant to say that Samadabhadra is the Dharmakaya, the ultimate nature. And Vajadara is the Sambhokakaya. And the emanating form is the Shakyamuni. But that is from the provisional meaning, that is from the apparent reality and from you know, on the level of apparent reality, not the ultimate meaning. So in the ultimate meaning, these three are not, they are inseparable. They are beyond colors and shapes and the differentiation. <coughs> so Mirabuja is trying to convince the Paldarpam that his lineage, that his lineage has the aspect of Dharmakaya, Samadhapatra. Sambhokakaya the Vajatara and Nimanakaya the Shakyamuni. What about the Longchenpa? To quote the Longchenpa, this quotation and what Mirabha is singing here, they fall, the boils down to the same essence, same meaning. He says, the Longchenpa says, the, the, un the unchanging nature of all things, the unborn nature of all things is the Dharmakaya. And, uh, and that is actually referring to the abiding nature of all things, which is the emptiness. And from within the emptiness, all kinds of apparent reality, such as the, the universe, which is the content, and all beings, as the contents, all, this, all the outer appearances are the Sambhokakaya. And uh, whatever appears, whatever appears like a rainbow, like a shadow, like a like a reflections. These are like these are the nirmanakaya, the un, 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 unobstructed appearances that appears are nirmanakaya. So he says that no phenomena is without these three aspects. With these three aspects. And all the phenomena, whatever appears, all the knowable phenomena are the expression or the manifestations of the three kayas or the three realities. So the Dharmakaya is unchanging, unchanging because, because the abiding nature, the ultimate nature of all things never changes, whether, the, for example, whether the beings in their ordinary level, in their extraordinary level, in their enlightened level, the nature, the abiding nature never changes. So it says that uh, when it comes, when the things appears, when Buddha appears, for example, 
the pure appearances, the impure appearance, when you talk about that. Because, when you talk about the stages of appearances, when it talks about the different levels of appearances, first one is Matakba, which is the impure appearances. So whatever the ordinary, to the ordinary senses of the perception appears, they are impure because they are perceived through uh, the confusion within the dimension, the confused state of mind. And secondly, it is the pure, it is the pure perceptions. Because to the, uh, the, in that second level, uh, our mental state have evolved and has have realized a certain portion, a certain level uh, of uh, the reality, true reality. And so that's why it's a pure, pure, pure perceptions. But on the ultimate level, on the third kind of a level of understanding of perception, there's a, it is inseparability of pure and impure. There's, there's no dualistic perceptions. So that's why the ultimate stage is actually similar to the Dramakaya, which is why the long chain says it is unchanging. <clears throat> So, when we hear this kind of you know, subtle explanations of the realities, especially when it says that ultimately our everything nature is pure uh, and changeless, when we hear this, it encourages us. So, it encourages us and it motivates us. It gives us a hope of being able to transform. Because uh, if uh, our nature doesn't have the aspect of purity and you know, all the changeless aspect, or non-changing aspect, then it would be a little bit uh, inappropriate or some kind of, uh, it could be a paradox to one day realize the Dharmakaya. So we could, so we are able to realize our Dharmakaya because we have that Dharmakaya uh, even in our ordinary level. <clears throat> so, so when you talk of the appearance that arise from within the Dharmakaya, when you talk about the appearances, the, the, the apparent reality, for example, the outer appearances, so the, the ordinary mind, they appear as the world and it's called independence. The world and the, the world, the contents and the container and the contents. The world is the container and the beings and the, con and the contents in, in, a pu in, in impure form in a form that is imperfect. So that same appearances that the impure beings perceive as impure or imperfect is at, at, the, at the same time uh, not uh, separate from the Dharmakaya, which is pure, changeless. So, for example, the being such as a long chin, for example, who is a real as a being, to his from his perception, from his level of understanding, uh, so the Dharmakaya is changeless, is unborn. So, so Dharmakaya is pervasive or incompassive, encompassing. So the encompassing nature of all things, the pervasive nature of all things is a Dharmakaya. So, and then, uh, and when, uh, when Miller says that his lineage also contains or consists of the, the lineage of the Sambakakaya, the Sambakakaya, who marks the signs. Miller says that the, all the marks and signs. Sambhukakaya is the is the, the reality the sama, uh, that is uh, endowed with the marks and signs. And according to the Long Chinba, yeah, it, it is the, the, the myriad appearances of uh, the universe. 
and the beings in it. Because according to Long Chamber, these appearances, these myriad appearances, are possible only within the expanse of the Dharmakaya. So the, uh, these, these appearances, these appearances just like a magical display, magical display of, uh, of the abiding nature itself, which is Dharmakaya. So, uh, so to a realist being or to the realist mind in, in from their level of meditative uh, percep perceptions, these appearances and the source of appearance, which is Dharmakaya, are inseparable. But then why we have this depreciation that emptiness is back, the appearance is back, emptiness is back, which is the Dharmakaya, and the appearance is, and the appearance is back, which is the which is the with the which is the appearance, right? The appearance in myriad forms. So these are actually differentiated uh, because of the ordinary mind, because of the ordinary dualistic uh, mind. And uh, I'm talking about the Nirmana Kaya. Uh, even though the Melarapa is the, the, the kind of a Buddha's form of a Buddha that benefit beings. And according to the Long Chinpa, to cross check this with the Long Chinpa, he says that the Nirmanakaya is a self arising, kind of self arising, self arising, free from uh, conceptual elaboration, it's like a shadow. So, all the things are according to Dzogchen is a Rangsha, which is self arising. If it is not self arising, there won't be a self liberation. So, when you talk about the self liberation uh, that liberates on its own, it is possible only because in the first place it was self arising. Self arising in a sense that uh, it, was, it is not dependent on any cause or the conditioning factor, rather, it arose on its own. Everything arises on its own. So this way, Long Chin was for Portaline says that uh, there's no phenomena or there's no realities, no appearances that is not adorned or that is not uh, um, related to the three forms of Buddha. Which is the Dharmakaya, Sambhakakaya, Nirmanakaya, or the three realities. So the appearance is unobstructed. They can appear in myriad forms and they are unobstructed. So that's why Milarapa is pointing out to the, the definite kind of lineage, not the lineage in a cultural or traditional way, but rather in the meaning wise, but then a definite. In the, the lineage, the lineage in in in, in, in regard to the definitive meaning of teachings. So there's no phenomena that's not endowed or not or ornamented with the three kayas or the three realities. Launching <clears throat> So whether it is a phenomena, an ordinary phenomena, an extraordinary phenomena, and uh, they're all uh, not separated, they're never in, they're inseparable from the three kayas or the three realities. And so from that ultimate point of view, there's nothing to be liberated, there's no, nothing confused. So, uh, objectively, all the sense fills, like the forms and sounds and smells and tests, all this are also, if we analyze, they are not separable, separate, separate from the three kayas. And even on the subjective level that perceives the outer, outer appearances or the outer phenomena, they are also, and when we analyze the mind itself, we realize that those, all those outer appearances are just, just a display or just a projection, a beautiful projections of the mind itself.
So all those display, the auto display, uh, no matter how much, how concrete they appear to the ordinary mind, all those you know, outer appearances are not separate from the three kinds, three realities. Everything is a display of the three kinds. <clears throat> so when we say when we say the display, so we talk about the magical display that the where the myriad appearances are like a magical display, magical display of the Dharmakaya itself. So when we use the word magical display, the benefit is that we want to cling to that. If you know that it's a magical display, then we won't be attached to the things that appear to our senses. Again, to quote from the lineage, Kaju lineage prayer, so the, in the essence in the essence of the undistract, undistracted mind so whatever appears whatever appears and whatever appears in the confused state of mind then nature <clears throat> At the nature of these confused appearances, uh, or these myriad appearances that appears, that or the perceived by the confused mind, at their nature, so at their nature is there is this pure abiding uh, kind of aspect. So, at their nature is uh, uh, unelaborated or free from uh, conceptual elaborations. Their nature is free from conceptual elaborations. All the thoughts can appear, thoughts can appear in all well, we're gonna marry, myriad forms. But at their nature is the is kind of a state, a pure state, a natural state that is free from conceptual elaborations. So, to uh, a realist a yogin or years meditator. Everything that appears becomes kind of a fuel for their meditation. It only ends up uh, enhancing their meditation. So, so that's why uh, so that's why we can uh, actually cross check between the smaller songs and, uh, and, and, the, and the writings of uh, Long Chinba, which falls, uh, which boils down to the same kind of meaning. <clears throat> so Miller is saying that my lineage has these three aspects, and do your lineage have that aspect? So when he say the Nyama, which means a female student. Because Miller is talking, uh, during, making this conversation with his female student, uh, Paldarbum. So that's why, especially in a Himalayan culture, we have the group of women or a group of uh, women who practice together are called Nyama. Nyama or a female student. I've seen that a lot and I've seen this a lot in Sikkim. And in Sikkim, they even have a Nyama Lagang or the Nyama tem temple for the female students, female practitioner, you could say. They would, they would either practice the Avalokiteshvara, they would do, and they would sing, practice with the melodies of this. And also, you can also find so many fake students, fake female practitioners. But this is the real one. Miller was talking talking with the real or genuine female practitioner. So Bodanchi Longo Sin Pete Bandoji Changin Dany to go on to the Zamba Shakya to Badansum Jumba the Sum Dan Dimbe Naljrumpa Lagdi. Jiba de Sumla Debe, 
nyamadayedam chego kun la chamba kun do zangbo dai chi longo sembe chaba do chi chang chen dai ni chego do den zaba shakya tu ba da som yuba do som da den be na jo ba da la te yuba do som la de be nyamad no Ajaba kundo zambo dajji. Fosu samen da badra, da prabisip dar makaya. Second is the great vajardra, da sambaka kaya, marks and signs. Third is shakja muni, da nirmana kaya, that benefits beings. I am a yogi who holds these three lineages. Is there a female student with faith in the three three? Yedam. So, although Miller was directing these songs to the Baldarbom, the, the female student of his time, but it is also imperatively talking to us too. Because with the unbroken lineage, or pure lineage, our experiential knowledge, the realization would hardly uh, take place in our minds. So that's why we at least need to have the inspiration. We need to draw uh, the, the inspiration or the Kalpitan has to dawn in our mind in order to. So that's why even to receive empowerment, the, the, the Guru who is, in, uh, who is uh, bestowing the empowerment need to have that broken lineage. <clears throat> So also only through the pure the, the, the presence of the pure lineage with unbroken lineage that we that, that enhances uh, the inspiration, the confidence and the motivation to it. So, so especially nowadays because of the internet. You know, you can find all kinds of teachings and all kinds of even the transmission on the on the on the internet. But this that is not really going to really work. Because you need to have that one-to-one -one kind of a connection with the lineage masters. So here, Miller also emphasizes the importance of lineage. So, especially if you're following a tantric, tantric practices or a tantric path. Uh, and like uh, first we need to start with the human kind of a masters, the real masters, the conventional master, human master, and then gradually we should be able to evolve that. And uh, be able to uh, able to, able to uh, able to perceive not only the human guru as the guru, but also everything that appears should uh, should appear as the guru. The, so we can say the guru of the apparent reality. So that is possible only uh, with the first encounter with the human guru. So, so the Pelderboom is inspired. So, this Pelderboom is now inspired that Millerby has a good lineage. So, so how to now the next song? She, the next song is the answer to her question. The song about how to rely on qualified gurus. So, so she wants to know how to. Uh, rely on the qualified gurus, how to follow a guru. And so Miller sings in response. So it talks about, so Miller will go on uh, explaining about the importance of the guru and following the guru and the ways, uh, the correct, the genuine ways of following the guru. So he's so the song's contents the how to follow a guru uh, in, in outer inner and secret way so he says that outer guru portrays the external as a continuum of consciousness so the guru that we follow outwardly is external guru the inner guru shows the internal as the continuum of awareness so all the teachings that we receive teaching that we carry in our heart becomes the inner guru and the ultimate guru shows mind is ultimate and ultimately when we when we, when we uh, realize the true nature of our mind and we see everything uh, the, our, our nature of mind a source of everything including the guru so that is the ultimate guru 
So we can also call the fundamental guru. We can also call the guru, the ground guru. So we can, so we can talk about the ground guru, the path guru, and the resultant guru, the guru on the path. Like for example, in one of the Dzogchen texts called Ati, Ares of Ati, uh, it says that the kind guru is it should be should always be perceived in the in the in the center of our heart or at the crown of our head. The kind guru, the gracious guru, should always be perceived or, or maintained or hold close to our center of our heart or at the crown of our head. Even to the even to the point where we perceive the gurus on the point of our fingers, we should we should always visualize and imagine the gurus. Guru resides, guru abides in everywhere, even to the even to the tip of our fingers. So if you're able to remember and uh, imagine and visualize the guru in this way. We are, we are following the thousands of Buddhas. We, we, we are holding the qualities of even the thousand, thousand Buddhas. So this shows the importance of the Guru. So in order to understand the full, full-fledged uh, you know, uh, uh, inspiration of a guru. In order to have that inspiration, we understand the significance of the guru, the full fledged significance of the guru. So first, we need to start with following uh, outer guru, which is a human guru. So the outer guru is the first one, an authentic guru, a realist being. For example, Milarepa also uh, did encounter other gurus before he met his uh, real guru, the marvelous one. So before that, he actually had several gurus, but their teachings didn't help him because his karmic connection was not yet ripened. And so, and so he's ripened. His karmic connection, the guru that he has karmic connection with, was marvelous. So the moment he hear the name Marba, he was. Uh, he was uh, drawn to Marba and uh, so that's why I think like for example Pagmutuba, one of the students of Kamboba he, he has he has one of the prayers that I often recite there's this quote from uh, this Pomotopa. Like through, throughout all my lifetime, through a series of my lifetimes, until I become enlightened, until my mind and the Guru's mind uh, dissolve into one. May I, may I always follow, may I always follow, venerate, and uh, uplift the Guru through respect, through offerings, and through veneration. So, through veneration, and, and the best offering is to practice the instructions and the teachings that I receive. <clears throat> like Mirror, for example, he sacrificed his sleep, sacrificed his comfort, sacrificed his, uh, his food, and comfort, and luxury, and spent all his life in the mountains because, because he wanted to repay the kindness of his guru through his practice. So, in the same way, so for Pamodishituba, uh, so first is to follow the Guru you know, at all times and secondly to see the, perceive the Guru as the Buddha himself 
as the real Buddha, to perceive or to look at the Guru as the uh, as the Buddha himself in, in, in a human form. So, so to have a devotion to the Guru uh, regarding him as the Buddha. So, and he, the second line he says, may I never, may I never be, uh, may I never fail in, in giving rise to the devotion of seeing the Guru as the Buddha. <clears throat> and when one has placed the full confidence and devotion in the Guru, it doesn't matter what kind of character, what kind of personality, what kind of uh, how the guru react, or how guru display his his. So, it sounds very difficult, I'm sure. It's very nowadays very easy to first you receive the teachings after a few months or years. Then there's even chances that you will sue your guru. <clears throat> there are many now. There are chances of uh, even uh, even the students, uh, you know, beating up the gurus. That might happen. I heard somewhere in the Swayambu, one of the one of the disciples, <laughs> beaten up the guru. <laughs> so I think this should not happen. I think we should we should remember the Pamadabha's words here. To follow the Guru in all lifetimes. And we when able to venerate, respect, always venerate and respect. And never see, look at the flaws of the Guru. Never look at the flaws of the Guru. Never look at the mistakes, errors of the Guru, but rather be able to see the Guru as the Buddha with the devotion. So I think the problem starts from there. Because oneself as an ordinary disciple, ordinary student, is still confused. So from our confused perception, we, we start to see the errors and our own flaws in the Guru. And also on the Guru's part, sometimes the Guru may not be authentic, May it be genuine, and so in this way, the confusion or the clash between the clash between the guru and the disciple starts from there. So, so the, the, the courts, this kind of courts from the profound path of practice are very heavy. They had the weight. For example, so for example, Milirpa built, uh, built towers, tall towers, large towers on his own. And uh, even today, I think in modern times, uh, we, we, build this, uh, we build the similar towers, Milirpa, they're called Milirpa towers, but that's different. Uh, different. The way Miller, the way Miller built the towers, and the way in the modern times we build the towers are different. So, so, so towers. Talking the Miller towers. Now uh, it's easy to build the towers because they have vehicles to bring the materials and every story you will have the sponsors and donors and by the time you finish the tower you will be a millionaire they have, yeah, because you have accumulated a lot of uh, donations for that. <clears throat> So that's why, that's why, if you really want to follow in the footsteps of the Milarabha, it's not about building the towers or the, even the Milarabha statues. Because whatever Milarabha went through were unimaginable in the modern times. Whatever he did was unimaginable. And his, the tower that Miller built was unimaginable. He built on his own. He brought all the materials, the rocks and muds and woods and everything. He brought on his own. He, he carried on his own, on his own back.
He built it. And, uh, but Marba, Marba actually make him dismantle again. Not only dismantle the tower and use the same material, but rather he says, wherever you burn this rock, you have to uh, take back, return to the same place, the source. So in this way, he's back by the time he finished one tower, his bag was uh, full of wounds, bruises. Uh, even worse than the and the mules or the horses that carry the lords. So that's why th th those things are unimaginable. Unimaginable. And so we should understand from the uh, from the definitive meaning, which is about uh, why he did that. So, and he had to go through all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, adverse circumstances. But even in, in the presence of the Marwa, who was supposed to be an authentic guru. So, so, man, so he had to face all kinds of challenges and hardships and embarrassment. So this so, so in modern times so the guru actually makes someone go through all these kind of hardships. I think definitely the students will sue the guru in modern times. So, especially in, in, in modern times, that's why we cannot really live up to the. Uh, we, we cannot do like the Miller Rabba. We will easily break the commitments. And, uh, so, that's why the Pamojabas prayer uh, so that may never be able to give rise to a wrong thoughts or the wrong perceptions of a guru. So whatever the guru display in his character, his personality, in his ways, his temperament, so whatever the guru displays, no matter how gurus represent themselves, so if you look at the uh, different uh, student, uh, teacher disciple relationship, like for example, Dindu and Naru, uh, they have uh, the same kind of hardship as Tekla has gone. Same with Naruba and Marpa, and Marpa and Milarba. So, although uh, outwardly it might seem kind of hardships, it looks like a torture, uh, looks like a, you know, a mal or ill treatment, but we should also know the reason, we should know the background of the. the the significance of going through hardships. So, so whatever the guru displays, what kind of a temperament, what kind of a personality, or the character that the guru display, one should always take them to be. Uh, we should always have kind of a pure vision or the pure outlook towards the guru's ways. And, so it says that we should always make offerings. But here, offering doesn't mean the material offering, it doesn't mean the wealth and the money. But the offering here is talking about one's own practice. We're offering through the practice. So we should. Not only uh, misjudge, not only misjudge, not only sh shouldn't we misjudge the guru, but also we should never interfere, never interfere. Not only the guru, but also when we have followed, started to follow guru, not only shouldn't we judge the guru, but also we should able we should be able to tolerate, be able to tolerate and endure the hardship that we face from other people, from other beings, like for example ABC words, like like for example ABC words. 
we should be able to see immediately, realize immediately that the moment when people abuse us, we should know that they are the reflections of our own negativities. <laughs> and we should take that whatever mistreatment or whatever uh, difficulties that we face in the presence of the Guru should be uh, kind of a process of training, a kind of process of verification. And this, this applies to the abusive abuse and all these uh, hardships and difficulties that we face uh, when, we, when we deal with the other people. So we should always give rise to uh, the motivation or the intention to help others. Even if someone abuses us, we should be ready to benefit them wherever we can. Always have the intention and what benefits, that the continuous benefits, kind of the intention and motivation to benefit others. We should always be able to practice a paradox, like if they abuse me, I will, I will, I will respect them. If they disrespect me, I will respect them. So in this way, we should always be able to give rise to the intention or the motivation to help. Although it looks very difficult, I think it might even annoy us when we hear this. But if you are really practicing the bodhicitta, you are practicing the altruism, regarding, regarding the words of the Pamantrupa, regarding the words of Pamantrupa, this is this can be found in the prayer in the prayer book of the Kaju language, Kaju prayer book, Kamsang prayer book, Kamukaju prayer book. So there's not. So all those of you who, are, who, who use the prayer book, Kaju prayer book, you might have read this before, but you didn't pay attention to the meaning, you only recited. The outer Guru portrays the external, external as the continuum of consciousness. The inner Guru shows the internal as the continuum of awareness. The ultimate Guru shows mind as the ultimate continuum. I am a yogi who has these three, these three Gurus. Is there a female student with faith in these three? Mm. So again, she goes on to ask about the empowerment. So, okay, so you have, you seem to have follow, follow. Of, so actually, the Pantrapum is raising a lot of questions to Melaraba. Okay, so you have the lineage, you have uh, followed, you have, been, you have met with the Guru. And so what about the empowerment? Do you receive the empowerment? So if you have received the empowerment, so what are the empowerment? What is the, what is the what kind of empowerment that you have received? So he was more or less... Uh, uh, so Peldarbun was more or less being a little bit nosy in a good way, trying to test on a Melaraba. So this also shows a kind of a free kind of a, a communication between in, in the in the past time in in the olden days, where. So he talks about the Peldarbun so asks Melaraba about the, how how did he receive empowerment? The song about the kind of abhishekha one should receive. 
He says, blessing the vase or the head is the outer Abhisheka or the empowerment. Showing one's body to be the deity's form is the inner Abhisheka. Pointing out one's true nature is the ultimate Abhisheka. I am a yogi who has these three Abhishekas. Is there a female student here who will request these three? So everyone knows about this. Everyone knows about placing the vase on the head. So once, whenever we come to the empowerment, we don't look at the guru. We look at the was made of gold or silver. If it is a wooden was, some kind of a low quality material, then I think we will doubt the empowerment. But actually, uh, the was itself has nothing to do with the gold or silver. But what matters is that through the meditation, the Guru has visualized the vase as the mandala, and within that mandala, Guru has visualized the deity, the idea of whatever empowerment that we are, uh, that we are going to receive. So, the blessing to vase on the head has actually the significance of the capacity to puri purify or impure what is in the mind. But so, so this is why, anyway, merely blessing the vase on the on, on, on the hate is the outer abhishekha. It's just, it's just a permission. It's like a jena, which is a permission. The, it's a permission to practice. But, but then, with the placement of the burn was, was is being placed on the head, and if you have drunk the nectar, if you have, if you, if you, if you have to drink it, and if you have understood the meaning of that, so just because we have received the vase, bless the Guru has blessed the vase on our head, and if we drink the nectar or the whatever liquid that is in the vase, doesn't make us, um, doesn't qualify us to be qualified to have received the environment. So, receiving the receiving uh, kind of placing the vase on our head is the first kind of empowerment. So, so anyway, when it comes to the numeration, uh, vase empowerment is the first one, secret empowerment is the second one. Wisdom is a third important, and a meaning is a fourth important. So, uh, in order to follow the stages, so the kind of a stages, there's a stages, and it starts with the placement of a vase and drinking the liquid or the the nectar from the from the vase. There is on the basic level, and although it is on a basic level, but it's very important so that we can. Uh, follow along the stages of uh, different levels of empowerment. So, especially, so the, this empowerment comes from the actually the practice of the tantras. The tantras comes in many different, uh, come, for example, in a four levels of tantras. Uh, the first two, uh, first two being the lower tantras, and the last two being the upper or the higher tantras. So, especially in the higher tantras. We talk about this kind of uh, uh, criteria of uh, following different stages of empowerment. So that's why the Miller says that merely placing the vase on the head is the outer Abhishekha, which is also important, but not the end. And second one is uh, showing one's body to be the deity's form of the Abhishekha. So first the Guru bless the vase on our head, that's the first empowerment, and then Guru make us to drink the liquid or the nectar from the uh, vase. That is called the uh, secret, uh, secret empowerment. So that is, uh, the purpose of that is to visualize our own body, or imagine our body, meditate on our body as the mandala of the deity. And then third one, uh, pointing out mind's true nature is the ultimate Abhishekha. So this is the ultimate empowerment. Called uh, uh, the empowerment, the, the word empowerment. So there is more or less pointing out the giving of the pointing out instructions, pointing out the true nature of our mind. And if you're able to realize it, we have received that empowerment. If not, this is just a word. So once we have received that empowerment, 
we are entitled or we are qualified to look at all things as pure, pure mandala. So, so Milarpa says, I am the yogi who has these three impermanence. So are you willing to receive this empowerment, Miller Bhaks? Nuwang rang le la guru te ma nang ge wa Sim ye rang o che ba de ge wa Wa de sum da de be nal jurong ba la e de Wa de sum shu e nya ma ja ye dam Blessing the ones on the head is the Audra Bishika Showing one's body to be the deity's form is the inner Abhishekha. Pointing out mind's true nature is the ultimate Abhishekha. I am a yogi who has the three Abhishekhas. Is there a female student here who will be who will request these three? These three. So, so this is for the those people who are obsessed with receiving empowerments, familiar with all receiving empowerments. So usually we end up thinking that empowerment means uh, placing the was on our head, drinking the uh, drinking the liquid, and eating the you know uh, the ritual pills. And we think that if you don't get receive that, we we feel that we haven't received the empowerment. That's wrong. So, but we need to know the true significance of the true significance and the true meaning of the empowerment. So actually, uh, we should know that, that we receive the empowerment only through the transformation of mind, not through eating or taking some kind of pills or liquid or placing something on our head. So I know uh, many people yeah. are uh, interested in empowerment, to receive empowerment. We, we, but then just because we are in the gathering of an empowerment, a gathering of people who are receiving empowerment, just because we are present there doesn't make us qualified to be receiving empowerment. So that's why we need, we, we, we at least need to listen to the Guru, what he is saying. And especially listen to every word that he reads, recites, chants and says. So that we understand every levels, every hints that the Guru is uh, putting forward. And at least, so be able to transform oneself. By receiving oh, and we need, and especially we need to develop. We need, should be able to develop the pure outlook once we have received empowerment. To see, to, at least at that time, to look at the guru, or perceive the guru as the as the Buddha, as the Buddha, and even oneself as as the form of a deity, form of a Buddha. Uh, we need to have all this, uh, you know, uh, inner transformation going on when we receive the empowerment. So, if you're able to do that, even if the was is not placed on the head, even if you have not, uh, not, not drank or have the liquid, there's nothing wrong there. You have actually received the empowerment. So, we should never uh, think that. Uh, Never be carried away by you know by this kind of materialistic kind of uh, aspect of the empowerment. Rather, we have to go for the meaning, the meaning, the significance of the guru, the significance of the empowerment. So, so when we understand the meaning of the empowerment. When, when that meaning actually arises in our mind, when we're able to give rise, when we're able to transform from within because of the empowerment, that is the reception and empowerment. So, so we, all, all the most of you don't have time to read, read the instructions, read the books about the empowerment and uh, where the empowerment is given, the meaning of empowerment, and so on. Because uh, in, especially in the Himalaya, we have a culture of uh, respecting the texts, 
and making offerings and placing them on a higher level, on, on a higher shelf, and never even uh, uh, considering to open the uh, open and flip through the books. So it's good to listen to the guru what he were, he's saying from the on when he's sitting on the throne. Be able to listen to him. And listen and know the significance of the empowerment. So, so it's the Guru's uh, duty to explain everything that he is doing. So he does explain, uh, but then it's on the, in our hands whether we understand or not, whether we are listening or not. So then after the empowerment, again Baldurbum continues asking the Miller if he has received any instructions. Okay, you receive the you received the empowerment. So what about the instructions? Have you received any instructions? So in response, uh, Miller was singing the song, the song about the kind of ultimate guiding instruction one should receive. The outer guiding instructions is hearing, contemplation and meditation. The inner guiding instruction is letting rock meet bone with awareness. So Miller is the first kind of instruction that I received is hearing or listening to teachings, reflecting on the teachings and trying to meditate and incorporate the meaning of the teachings and in, in, in bringing that into, into meditation. Whether it's the Mahamudra teachings or Soksan teachings. So the first kind of instruction that uh, Miller has received is the threefold, uh, threefold learning of hearing, contemplating, and meditating on the teachings that Guru had given. The second kind of the inner kind of instructions that he received is letting rock meet bone. What is rock meet bone? Rock meet bone with means to be able to face all kinds of circumstances, even if. if whether, whether it's a favorable circumstances, whether it's an adverse circumstances, in all kinds of circumstances and situations, if we're able to practice, if we keep that calmness, if we keep able, that, uh, able, able to face it, be able to carry on or transform all the circumstances on the path of practice, then that is the inner kind of guiding instructions. So, so that is what the you know, rock meat bone means. So when we talk, when we say favorable, uh, favorable circumstances, for example, some people praise us, some people talk good about us, we are being respected, we are, you know, we are awarded, and so on and so forth. That's a good, uh, favorite part. So even at that time, we shouldn't be, you know, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be carried away by this kind of uh, favorable circumstances. If we are a genin, if you are a genin Dhamma practitioner, you will never be carried by the favorable circumstances such as praise, name, power, you know, prestige, and rather take all things on the path of the practice. That is, be able to balance the good and bad, be able to balance between favorable and unfavorable circumstances. And, uh, be consistent and be stable and uh, in in practice so that is what we mean by the rock meets rock meet the bone and that is clearly demonstrated by Miller by himself by not not you know bothering by the good food good sleep good clothes good place to stay and so on and so forth he never he he lived on the same kind of rack that he is wearing from the day one and he has a dark face because of having to uh, rely or sustained by the uh, on plants, little plants. And he only had the walking stick and a few other positions which are very basic. So, so he was a perfect living example. Uh, uh, he has clearly demonstrated from his own actions how Dharma should be carried on in all kinds of uh, circumstances, in all kinds of situations. So for Melarama, the gods, for example, came to his favor. The gods, 
when the demons actually tried to attack him and humans came in many different kind of a character and personality or treatment to him but to him at the end he won everyone he won the heart so he was able to he able to let the rock meet bone so a rock meet the bone and sometimes if the if he hit the rock if he hit ourselves he, for example if he hit our hit ourselves with the rock with the rock we can we, we can feel the pain right we can feel the pain so in the same way this mean to preserve when we say rock meet the bone it means to put effort he means to persevere he means to tolerate the hardships to persevere to endure the hardships and difficulties that's what mirror means to say rock meet bone so mirror but also implying that we cannot do dharma practice in favorable always in favorable conditions everything going wrong well. so okay so anyway this so this doesn't actually end so we have so many things to say here but we can so anyway this is inner kind of instructions the ultimate guide instructions experience and realization free of meeting or putting so the kind of a, the ultimate guiding instruction is to be able to practice practice consistently free of meeting and putting free of meeting and putting means constantly constant continuously day and night so whether it's day and night whether it's a good day or bad day it's a good time bad times Uh, adverse circumstances, good circumstances, favorable, unfavorable circumstances doesn't matter. Be able to, being able to practice in all, in all circumstances, consistently, uh, letting loose, you know, never uh, relaxing. That is the ultimate kind of instructions. Whatever the physical moments that we make becomes the practice. when whatever we do becomes a practice that is the mark of the ultimate instructions for example in the island of gold even if you want to search for the rock or pebbles we are not going to find because it is island of gold so this why in a same way when we when we develop this pure outlook when we develop this uh, secret outlook towards everything inside out everything appears pure everything everything appears favorable and th- so this way in this way we are able to carry on every circumstance on the path of practice we talk about a spiral path or upward spiral path and downward downward spiral path upward spiral path is directly being born in uh, becoming uh, in uh, becoming enlightened and the downward spiral path is uh, being falling down in the in the unfortunate states so that's why So when we pray for example to sponsors and donors for example we need to pray like that that they would be able to encounter with a uh, in a spiral up, uh, upward spiral path that mm. so I am a yogi who has these three guiding instructions so when a middle person experience and realization free of meeting or parting free of, free of meeting and parting this is very important especially in the followers of mahamudra like the telopa there was last instruction to narba was like he said geho he said he said that this ordinary mind it is it is a self aware this is the wisdom of self aware wisdom so tell me said that uh, he, he said that this this ordinary mind that mind that we are experiencing this ordinary thinking mind is self aware wisdom 
But to explain how it is, to explain its characteristics, its nature, characteristics, and the function, that it is beyond words and expressions. It's beyond expressions. It is even beyond imagination. It's beyond what the world of expressions in words, in words, and also beyond expressions be an imagination or be on thoughts. So that's why the Lupa, the I, the Lupa, doesn't have no more to say or no more to teach. I have nothing to say. Says that, uh, and the Lupa says that he has completely lost. Uh, the words, lost for words, and expressing the two nature. So, so there's no words that can explain or describe the two nature. So the only way is to practice. The only way is to practice one pointedly, to focus one pointedly on the two meaning, to let it go, to relax, uh, and be able to experience and realize to gain realization free of meeting and falling, which means consistently. There is a one, one, one terminology, for example, called Ladawa, Ladawa, which means to cross over. And so, if we, if the mind realizes the mind itself, if the mind realizes true nature, if mind experiences the self-realization, realizes self-awareness, self-awareness, then there is the way to realize. If not, it's the beyond words and imagination. And, uh, so for the, uh, when we realize the true nature of mind, to realizing the moment we realize is the moment we, liber we are liberated. So this, there is the inseparability of liberation and the realization. So this is what uh, meeting or putting means. <coughs> The outer cutting instruction is hearing, contemplating, and meditating. The inner cutting instruction is letting rock meet bone with awareness. The ultimate cutting instruction is experience and realization pre of parting, meeting or parting. Ama Yogi has his three cutting instructions. Is there a female student here who will request these three? Yet Reguado Rejava non get Yamdu Dudal Maba den get Nidisum dan den benal drobala de Tidisum shuve yamada yed. The four foundations. Yelada Rejay. Nijanja <laughs> Shiba Kurwa Dajo Dunga Zamgya Dato Nari 
这个特别是名光的家，今年三百章主，今年三百章主，今年三百章主，今年三百章主，今年三百章主，今年三百章主，今年三百章主，今年三百章主，今年三百章主，今年三百章主，今年三百章主，今年三百章主，今年三百章主
So now, uh, continuing from the conversation between Father Bomb and Malar Rabba, and she again asks that, okay, so you have received the instructions. What about the Jew? Jew instructions, Jew practice. So what is the Jew in the, in the, in the first place? The pra Jew practice. So actually, it is a, it, it, Jew is mainly the practice that focus on the transforming, taking all the adverse circumstances on the part. Chu is a kind of a practice uh, of taking all the unfavorable circumstances like sickness, illness, you know, misfortune, you know, appease, all kinds of things that all kinds of unfavorable conditions and circumstances. That, so we're trying to bring them to the path of practice. So instead of saying, protect me, Instead of saying, may I have a good luck and so on and so forth, we are trying to say, okay, may I be sick? If there is a good in being sick, let me be sick. If there is a good in being die, may I be die? So in this way, we are trying to... <coughs> okay? No? Yeah? So true practice is actually uh, is a kind of a practice in reality. It's a kind of a practice that to bringing all the circumstances, negative circumstances, on the path of practice. So usually in other practices, we try to specify the problems. We try to uh, you know you can recover from the illness and uh, so this way. But in a true, we're doing some some paradox, some kind of a, and in a different way. So, so instead we are sacrificing ourselves, we are sacrificing our body, sacrificing our, our, our fortune, uh, everything, we are sacrificing everything actually, uh, because now we see that the, the things that I cling to, they are the causes of all the problems and misfortune that I have, so now I have realized realize it so with that realization so we are ready we are preparing ourselves to sacrifice everything so it could be sickness misfortune abuse you know from so so this is more or less directly dealing with our own ego uh, you know ego clinging or the, the idea of self the ego clinging you could say <coughs> So we are trying to bring them a counter, counteracting activities. We are trying to uh, practice in a. So usually the those things that we call favorable condition, we sacrifice it. And those that we consider unfavorable, we take them in. We adopt, to adopt. It. And for that, I think we need the courage. We need the courage and fortitude. We need to have the weak heart to do this practice. We need to have that courage to do, that brave heart to take this breath, uh, to this breath. Because here is, it concerns all about sacrificing the good, the, the conventional good, sacrificing all the so-called fortune, good health, you know. And then we try to adopt, or try to take in all the good things, all the, the so-called bad things, or the misfortunes, or the adverse circumstances into ourselves. So to do this, we need to have that brave heart, have a brave heart. So first of all, uh, the first thing to remember is that uh, to recognize the root of all problem, which is ego clinging, and so more or less all this so-called fortune, good health, and all these actually are actually a kind of a ego tree for ourselves. We are trying to aggrandize. We are trying to please the ego. We are trying to add more and more. We are trying to feel the ego clinging. So that's why, with the help of, with the practice of the chu, we are trying to do the something uh, an opposite, something opposite. So instead of saying no misfortune, we say let the misfortune come. Instead of saying no sickness, we say let the sickness come. So, so that's why we need to have a certain degree of courage here. So courage. And that courage has nothing to do with the outer appearances, or, but rather the courage here is to you know, be face to face with the ego clinging, to deal uh, openly with the ego clinging. So that's why.
So he said, the roaming in the rugged mountain retreat is the outer chair, casting the body away as food is the inner chair, cutting to the root of the unique is the ultimate chair. I'm a yogi who has this three concept chair. Is there a female student? So, first, second, third. So we talk about the places or the locations where we practice the chair. For example, the, in, the, in, the, in the writings of Aradewa, for example, on the chair, it talks about the four kind of places, suitable places to practice chair. The so first is the place, is the physical place, a physical location. <coughs> Second one is the body, for the, the speech, the mind. So for the chair practitioner, we need to know this. Uh, we need to know this for uh, for the pivotal or for uh, for vital places. So we need the, the first the roaming in a rugged mountain. So this rugged mountain, rigid, talks about the uh, about the the physical location of practicing the chair. So because in the, so, the vital place, the physical vital place, physical location, the second vital place is the body. First is the nene, nene, which is the physical, like a rugged mountain. This is the physical vital place. Physical vital place for the beginners. We should we should go to retreat because because in order to fight with the ego, we need to have that conducive place that enhances our our our, our dealing with the ego. So that's why we need that physical location to do the retreat, like the cemetery, like isolated place, like a solitude. So kind of kind of trying to test ourselves, our own, the, you know, the degree of courage to deal with the ego. So first the physical location or the physical vital place. Second is casting the body away as food. Casting the body away as food. So this is the the, the uh, vital places, the vital place of body and speech. So casting away the body as a food. So the vital place of body, speech, and mind. Body, body and speech is actually uh, content in this uh, in the second line. Casting away the body away as food. So, casting so, away. So, why the place of a speech is to actually sing the song, to sing the recitation in the church, singing. So the second one actually uh, contains the two kinds of vital places, vital place of body and vital place of speech. So the third third line, which is the cutting to the root of the unique, the unique is the ultimate chair. So this is the vital place of the mind. So more or less, uh, and focusing on the ego clinging, the root of all uh, problems. So even if there's if, if you're faced with the difficulties, the adverse circumstances, the hindrances and obstacles, we are not perturbed. We are not hindered, kind of kind of bothered, uh, inhibited by the this kind of obstacles. So to be able to maintain that kind of fortitude, not being being able to maintain that courage and bravery and fortitude, that is the third third kind of. So, like Aradeva said, uh, Aradeva subsumes all the uh, practice of Chu in the four lines, outer, 
uh, vital oh, outer vital place uh, vital place of the uh, physical location vital place of body vital place of speech vital place of mind so all the three practice actually is content in this four kind of vital <clears throat> So usually the church practitioner should go to the isolated place, especially to a haunted place, to the place, haunted place, the scary places. We need to go to a place where in a haunted house, haunted place, haunted forest. So we are supposed to we should be practicing there because to directly deal with our ego clinging, how much is scare. So if we shiver and then we are scared already, then we can do the chew there. Because even if there happens to be a demon or the gods or whatever, then so usually the outer chair should be practiced that way by going to the different physical places especially the scary places and haunted places like cemeteries so one should go to test our own degree of uh, you know the courage and the bravery to deal with the ego clinging so only to test we go to this kind of uh, haunted places and the second places so if uh, when if you encounter with the gods or evil spirit or some kind of obstacles, physical or spiritual uh, ob obstacles, we welcome them. As chair practitioner would welcome them because <clears throat> so you could only become friends with the ghost. Over time you could also become friends with the ghost. You can have a tea together. You can be the sponsor of the tea and then the, the ghost will be the guest. You can be... You can actually be friends with the ghost or evils or whatever. So this is how we tame, how we bring the evils under control. Not by scaring them away or... So sometimes there also happens where some people went to the sacred places. And then when they see the gods, they run away, throwing all the, uh, you know, the, the, the ritual instruments and run away. So I think in order to go to such haunted places, or secluded places, isolated places, we need to have a certain degree of understanding of the Chu. We need to study, reflect on the meaning of the Chu, then be prepared, well prepared. Then only we can go to the secular places. Because uh, we are going to not only deal with our inner ego, but also the, the reflections of the ego outside, which comes in a form of a god, sort of evil, obstacles. So this is how, this is what we mean by uh, the mountain retreat. So right now, when we do the chew in our home or in temple, it's just really a, like a learning process. It's just a basic kind of practice. I think many people are attracted to chew practice because of the singing. And, uh, so, uh, oh, but the singing alone is not the chew. Actually, it didn't talk about the melody. It talked about the experiential burst of singing, experiential burst of uh, what is it, chanting. It doesn't talk about the melody song, chanting, because the dung and the nyam is different. Nyam has to be something that comes out of experiences, out of inner experiences. Then you can outburst into some kind of a singing or chanting. So that is what uh, in it, the actually melody came into the church.
But if you just is attracted, mm. enchanted by the the near, uh, the sentimental uh, kind of a melody song of the Jew, then that's not enough. <clears throat> So, so if you are practicing of the church, then you need to understand this. These four vital places, the physical, vital places of the place, body, speech, and mind. Unless we are clear, if we really understand about these four vital places of practicing the church, then our church is going not going anywhere, not going to go anywhere. And especially the vital place of the mind it means to completely dismantle our idea of the god and the goddess, the good and bad, the four, especially the four devils or the four demons. Uh, so the ultimate choice is that if you're able to cut ties or if you're able to dismantle the idea of good and bad, the god and the demons, of, of this dualistic, dualistic kind of a, uh, mindset, then we have actually achieved the church, the purpose of the church. That is the vital place of the heart, or the place of the mind. Because uh, at the root of all the, you know, these hindrances, obstacles, and problems is our ego clinging that lies within ourselves, within the within the mind. So only when we able to, when we are able to dismantle this ego clinging, to the ego fixation, only when we are able to dismantle this, then we are able to free ourselves from the dualistic kind of a dualistic, dualistic fixation on the mindset, and thereby we are able to free ourselves from the problems. This serves the purpose of the church. This help oneself. It benefits not only oneself but also others. So other, if not, if you do not know all these things, just just singing the melodies, melodies too, and use all kinds of med- med- this original instruments, that's not that doesn't serve the purpose of the chair. This is called chair lock, which is the is a misusing of the chair. It's a chair lock, which is the misusing of the chair, because uh, we, it doesn't transform the, our ego clinging. It doesn't transform our we are not able to tame our mind. The more we sing, the more it only uh, brings more and more confusion. It doesn't minimize the intensity of confusions. So that's why it's the jello, which is the which is the misusing. So if we again again use the chew to chase away the demons or to to tame the demon, then that's not the way of the chui, I guess. Like, yeah. For example, in the Prashtam Paramita Sutra, of, uh, Buddha said that uh, the, in the Heart Sutra, for example, for example, the Machik Labdun, when she introduced the Chu in Tibet, when, he, when she introduced the Chu, she based his teachings on on the Prasthan Paramita Sutra, actually. I say the Chu means actually chop or to cut. So here, cut means what to cut. We are trying to cut the ego clinging. We are trying to cut ties with the ego clinging. Because at the heart of all the problems, at the root of all the problems, mass, and obstacles, is the ego clinging, the clinging to the ego, you know, that ego, ego, egotism. That is the heart of all the problems. So through the Chu practice, Chu is the direct antidote to cutting off or chopping off of the ego clinging. So, so as long as we have the ego clinging, we have the dualistic attitude. So in order to cut this too, we need to cut the, the root itself, which is the ego clinging. So when we say all appearances, being able to carry all the appearances on a part of the practice, all appearances means God and Goddess, demons and everything, good and bad, everything, everything should be uh, transformed into the path of practice. So we shouldn't be just carried away by the melody, the sweet melody. And also we shouldn't be carried away by the just merely, merely praying, uh, playing the drums and bells.
<clears throat> so that's why it's good to remember these four vital places physical location, vital places of the body, vital place of speech, vital place of the mind. What the white place physical location means to go to the haunted places and the scary places to practice the church. And the white white and the white places so the body means to so we should be able to purify the channels and you know the secret channels and channels and winds and energies in the you know body. If you're able to, you know, to meditate and be able to purify and uh, the, the secret channels and energies in our mind, in, in the body, that is the uh, that's a vital places of the body. Vital place of the speech means to actually sing the melodious cheer out of experiential knowledge, out of experiential realization. And the, and, the, and the vital place of the mind means to be able to dismantle this ego clinging, which is the root of all evils, root of all good and bad, which is the root of or the cause that causes the dwell. So for example, in a chair practice, I saw some people crying. Especially some people cry because it is a, such a sweet melody. Because of sweet melody. Some people cry, they become emotional. That's not because that's not because uh, they they gain some kind of certainty in the reality. They gain some kind of realization rather is simply out of attachment to the sound. <clears throat> And most important, all of all these four uh, vital places is the vital places of the mind. What's the places of the mind? Which is dismantling the ego itself. Dismantling the hopes and fears, dismantling and cutting through, uh, cutting through the hopes and fears, the expectations and doubts, good and bad. This dualistic attitude, a dualistic mindset. So, if you're able to cut through the, this conception, the dualistic conception, so the first line, I mean the rigid is the outer chair, casting out the body as a put is the inner chair has a two. So all the four aspects of the chair is contained here in these three lines. For example, in the sutra, uh, good Buddha says. Because uh, Buddha says that the beings come in many different capacities of mind. Beings come in many different form, different capacities of mind. So, the Buddha said that uh, the beings come in many different capacities. So, in order to help them, uh, the, the only the best way to help them is to specify the suffering and so the cause of suffering. So, sufferings and the causes of suffering. So, causes of suffering means the, the cause of the suffering, which is the afflictive emotions and the negative karma. So, in order to specify the causes, the, the sufferings and the causes, in order to have the, uh, the instructions of cutting through. So this also uh, implies a little bit of uh, the true instructions. Even in uh, the presence of Manjushri, even this line from Manjushri, praise of Manjushri, is also uh, more or less related to the the, the, the meaning of the chu, or is implying the chu practice. 
to, to pacify the three kinds of sufferings, which means suffering of suffering, suffering of change, and uh, and a pervasive suffering. The first line says to pacify, to pacify the three kinds of sufferings and to pacify all three is to, uh, is to pacify the cause itself, which is the afflictive emotions, which is aff the subtle afflictive emotions and so maybe it says the sufferings of the three sufferings, sufferings of the three sufferings, to specify the sufferings of the three sufferings. So that is the result, which is the suffering itself. So, to specify the sufferings of the three sufferings means to uh, specify the suffering, the, all the sufferings and the, and the causes, which is, which is the afflictive emotions, the afflictive states of mind, and the negative actions. And at the root of all this is the subtle ignorance. Subtle ignorance. So only only through the uh, through the pacification of the three sufferings, sufferings of the three sufferings, we are able to gain the three kinds of liberation. <clears throat> So, and how to pacify, how to pacify the sufferings and their causes. So, the object, object, the object of pacification is the three sufferings and their causes. And the subject of purification or the agent that enhances, that helps to uh, pacify is to pacify, the result of pacifying the three sufferings is a three, three liberation. Three, three liberation, three liberating aspect, which is which is the mong, which is the nature, the abiding nature, rangshin, which is the characteristics, and uh, tukji, which is the compassion. So through the three kayas, ultimately, uh, dharma kaya, sabbaka kaya, nirvana kaya. So that is the result of uh, pacifying all three sufferings. <clears throat> So although uh, here we see that uh, we use the terms in the same terms but in different interpretations for different purposes in different texts and different uh, different teachings so we need to know that there are differences. So with the perspective of three sufferings we gain or we attain the three kinds of liberations three liberations although there is no three there's no new there's, there's nothing to number uh, the attainment doesn't have a number but at least uh, to number by their differences is the so more or less uh, with the with the perspective of three sufferings we attain the three attainments we attain the three liberations which are dharmakaya sambhokakaya and nirmanakaya
在那里碰到了，有的那那几个那些地方，几个那几个嘛，我这这是多少个？ For example, when we differentiate between the Jew practice and other practices, other Buddhist practices and other and the Jew practices, usually in other teachings we are trying to find out the the root of all the problems and then first uh, specify that and then specify the, the the results. But in the Jew, we are doing the other way around. First, we uh, work with the suffering itself, the, the, the result itself, and then gradually and cut the cut the the, the cause. Mm. <laughs> So here uh, we can understand this this uh, quotation from the Princess of Majushri in, th in, in in four ways. First is the what to be specify. There's a three uh, suffering, three kinds of suffering that causes. What is the gain from the what is the gain or what is attained from the pacification is the three liberations, three liberations or the three uh, three kayas. And uh, the, the pacification is the best on what? It's the best on the equanimity, like the sky, like the space, it says. Because, uh, because, at the, because at the ultimately, there's nothing to be pacified, and there's nothing to pacify, so that's why it's a complete equanimity. So the pacification is best on the equanimity. So I have received uh, several times on this praise to Majushri and uh, they uh, interpret this as uh, the impl implications of the church practice. Chetisumdandimbe <laughs> Chetisum <laughs> So now Peltra Pum continues, oh, the your chi is very good, your understanding chi is good. So he, he is very nagging here, so he keeps con uh, continuing to question him. So what about the fit? 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 So as we do... So the church, if the church is to, you know, adopt all the misfortunes or the negative, uh, uh, negative circumstances, then the faith is to turn every circumstance into something that is favorable, to turn, to transform the unfavorable conditions into favorable conditions. That is what the faith pages, the sound of the faith does. does. So that's why the Pelderbum asks about the faith. What is the name, meaning of the faith? 
So Fei has two syllables here, uh, two syllables in, 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 in Tibetan, Pa and Ta, there's two, and it, it stands for the skillful means and the, it stands for the skillful means of compassion and the emptiness, the wisdom of emptiness. So that's why he says collecting scattered thoughts is the outer path. Collecting, you know, gathering back the scattered path is outer path. So there's a pa and ta. So pa and ta makes the word pe, pet here. So so pa stands for the, the skillful, skillful method of compassion, and the ta uh, stands for the uh, the wisdom aspect of the wisdom, wisdom of emptiness. So, uh, so, so, what is the what is the scatter thought? Scatter thought means when our, when our mind is not tamed, our mind just run away, one just scattered to all kinds of uh, all kinds of sensual sense fields and sensual pleasures and there's no control and there's no power it, it's completely powerless it's completely tempted by these outer appearances and so so this is why collecting means bringing back so to the use of pack so the mind has completely gone out of control and so uh, a Chui practitioner, when the thoughts rush in his mind, when the thoughts seem to scatter out of control, so they use the word Fei. It is, it is said that it has the power or the capacity to bring back our, 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 our thoughts or the, to collect the thoughts of the, the scattered mind is actually calmed down. So it doesn't mean that it completely liberates one, but liberates one. But rather, when a mind is completely scattered, it's at least uh, it actually discontinue uh, the scattering of the mind. It brings back. So uh, again, when we say Fei and be able to calm down the, the restless mind, that's not all. That's, we shouldn't stop there. A, a, the, so that because there is uh, dealing with a more uh, gross manifestation, the growth or outer manifestation of our thoughts. When outer manifestation of thought is scattered, and with the help of the Fei, the sound of the Fei, we are able to bring back, we are able to discontinue the thoughts, we are able to at, at, at least cut through that, that restless mind or the scattered thoughts. So, fate, the sound of the fate is used to actually uh, collect back the scattered thoughts. Uh, only, and it only deals with the gross manifestation of the thoughts. But now, in order to uh, deal with a subtle, a subtle kind of a scattered thought, a subtle mind, subtle disturbed mind, or a subtle restless mind, we need to use, uh, for example, in the Heart Sutra, it talks about the emptiness, form, form is emptiness. There's a no form uh, inseparable from the emptiness, emptiness separate, separate, separable from the form. So, in this way, we need to use this fourfold emptiness. So the pa and ta has the 
has, has, has the connotations or has the has the meaning of uh, you know the the as the dual kind of a capacity of a skillful means and the wisdom of compassion so there's no uh, in many texts we can find the detailed explanation of the fay but in the church uh, text we can find the meaning of the fay in detail so all of the fay which is just one single word it is interpreted in different texts in different ways Okay. Uh, uh, I forgot what I was trying to say. <laughs> I forgot the quotation myself. It was at the tip of my tongue, but it slipped off. <laughs> okay, I will remember now. So actually, pa and ta has some of the weak male and the female. So pa, so here the, the collecting, collecting scattered thought is what is said here by Mela Rebo, but the, uh, actually pa has the capacity to collect the scattered thoughts. And that is dealing with the gross manifestation of the thoughts. Because uh, because it uh, discontinues, it, it cuts through the the scattered or restless mind. But then when it comes to the, to the subtle mind, and subtle thoughts, and subtle scattered mind, which is difficult to uh, which is difficult to uh, uh, deal with. So for that we use the word uh, the letter the syllable ta, which stands for the wisdom of emptiness, which. With the help of which we know the the inherent, we know the empty nature of the uh, the thoughts themselves. So, uh, if if you're able to cut or calm down the thoughts, but if you do not know the true reality of mind, then it will continue. The thoughts will arise again, and thought will perpetuate again. So that's why the pa and ta, pa, with the sound of the fa. It, uh, it deals with the gross manifestation of the thoughts. With the ta, it deals with the, the subtle manifestations, subtle manifestation or the root of the thoughts. <clears throat> so this is actually the union, uh, the co-emergent or the union uh, syllable of fat. Union of, compass union of compassion, pa, and the union of wisdom of emptiness, which is the ta. <clears throat> like the Saraha says that uh, the realizing the true nature of mind when realizes everything because the, 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 the nature of the mind is the root of everything so when we realize when we recognize the true nature of mind and also in one of the songs of the Biruaba, he sings that uh, the pure nature of one's mind doesn't need to be uh, it doesn't need to be elaborated. So this way, the collecting scatter thought is the outer fate. And secondly, rousing dull awareness. Dull awareness is the inner fate. When we meditate, we have this dullness. There's a dullness of mind. So the inner meaning is 
the inner meaning of fat is rousing the dullness. When you feel sleepy, we can say fat and wake up also. Resting in the abiding nature is ultimate fat. So first one, collecting scattered thoughts is the old one. It is the physical posture. Is is physical posture, for example, and arousing all dullness is the inner fat. This inner fat is 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 the recitation, the yoga of recitation. And resting in the abiding nature is the ultimate fat. This is resting on mind, or the, the yoga of remaining, or maintaining, or settling on mind in the abiding nature. The physical yoga. So the collecting scattered thoughts is the outer fed. This is actually also implying the, the, the yoga, the physical yoga. So second one, rousing all dullness is the inner fate. This inner fate deals with the recitation. The recitation of a physical recit verbal recitation, the mental recitation. So all the recitation that deals with the recitation of mantras or recitation, all kind of recitations, inner and outer recitation deals with this inner fate. The resting in the abiding nature is the ultimate fate. And the, the resting in the abiding nature of uh, abiding nature uh, means to actually settle our mind or bless our mind in the pure aspect or the pure nature of our mind or the natural state of mind. So, Rigba Dumi means the stainless mind, the stainless nature of mind. So we are trying to place our mind in a stainless nature. So when we... So stainless, peerless, or the natural state of mind. So uh, you should be careful with the with, with the with the words or the term the terminology that you hear, because the different texts will interpret it differently. And just because you heard it here today doesn't mean that in other texts it it is the same, because uh, different texts will interpret it in a different way. And so we also at the same time uh, need to be very careful with the terms and terminologies. <coughs> So when we uh, realize the unborn nature of the mind, unborn nature of mind, then we are able to rest in the abiding nature. When we, the moment we recognize the, the unborn nature of mind, that we are we are already resting in the abiding nature. So we say bless to bless. So. What do you mean by bless? If the mind, the mind's true nature is already stainless, or is peerless, is already natural and fresh, why should we bless it? So, so bless also shows that uh, uh, although uh, ultimately, uh, ultimately it is pure, uh, natural, and fresh, but. <coughs> Sangbanangi <laughs> Hey, 
I think we can go on and on. I still have more to say on this pet. On this pet. It's very profound pet, but maybe tomorrow.